Good afternoon. Thank you very much for coming. We have a lot of activities going on across the campus, for example. I know that there's a presentation starting right now also in the College of Arts and Sciences as part of the associate dean interview process. So for all those various reasons, as you can quickly see, we are uh, making a uh, audio-visual uh, record of each one of these uh, sessions, and I think that'll give us really a good uh, point of reference to go back to once we get through the whole process. As you all know, we've had the uh, Provost Lecture Series in place for two years, now entering into its third year, and for the most part, that's been focused on uh, things pedagogical. Curricular design, uh, technological solutions. In fact, many of the presentations have been on uh, uh, instructional technology and, uh, and and various kinds of application. And during that time frame, a lot of things have been going on in the university. And when I uh, reflect on those, I go back to about 1989, as I recall, when David Byrne invited Ernest Boyer to the Kansas State campus to give a guest lecture. And I didn't realize at the time Boyer was here, it might have been 1990. I didn't realize at the time Boyer was here exactly what was taking place at the time. Boyer, as you recall, with his colleagues at the Carnegie Foundation produced the book Scholarship Reconsidered. And Scholarship Reconsidered came on the market and it introduced new ideas in terms of what we mean by scholarship. And it, in effect, was a prophetic work. Because Boyer saw sooner than the rest of us that things were changing in the academy in ways that most of us had not yet detected. And he was really saying in Scholarship Reconsidered, at least from my perspective, Wait just a minute. Since World War II and maybe earlier, we've developed a standard model of scholarship in which the standard scholar is someone who teaches and does research and maybe throws in a little service. And in that standard model, what we mean by scholarship is that person's research in his or her discipline. And the way the world's shaping up nowadays, that isn't going to work in the future because it's too narrow, too confining. And the university's work is rapidly becoming diverse in ways that, that uh, won't accommodate that narrow model. So Boyer said, let's think about what people do in a scholarly environment and understand that they are undertaking the scholarship of discovery, which indeed is research in the discipline. And they're taking, undertaking scholarship in terms of putting that new information into a context that will someday render it useful. And they're undertaking a kind of scholarship that integrates that information in terms of its context into the, the world in ways that matter in terms of economics and social concerns. And people are doing scholarly work, not just in the discipline, but how the discipline's taught and learned. And in each of those areas, rigorous standards can be established against which people can be evaluated and rewarded. And by doing that, we can, we can capitalize on the strengths of every individual university in ways that you can't if you adhere to a narrow standard model. And if you consider a lot of what K-State's concerned itself with in the last three or four years, you realize that it all flows one way or another from Boyer's thought process, from Boyer's vision of what scholarship in the university of tomorrow is really going to have to be. And 
in that process, you reach a point where you then realize that it, to uh, carry this forward in pragmatic terms, you have to account for the differences that are manifest in different disciplines and different areas of work at the university, and in the broad stroke sense, those are colleges. And so the deans become more and more and more responsible for and involved in integrating the concept of scholarship in a new era into the workings of the university at the college level, which is where the heart and soul of work at a place like K-State tends to happen. And that is a very, very, very difficult thing to do. And it, it calls on uh, a new level of uh, thought and vision on the part of the deans and their colleagues that we've not tapped in this way before. And so it seemed very appropriate and in fact very important for the deans and their colleagues that they'll draw on to help them to uh, lead the university in presentations and discussions about what scholarship is in the various areas of the university's work as a point of reference but also a point of departure into a new way of considering this. And, and we could not do better in starting that process off than to call on Mike Hole and his colleagues in education, which is an ex a, a college with an extraordinarily diverse mission because of its undergraduate, graduate role at different levels, on campus, off campus, a clinical component in uh, teacher supervision, and an enormous service component that helps the Department of Education keep K-12 running day to day across the state. And so I think it's, a, it's an ideal point of departure in terms of looking at the diversity of what people do in a scholarly environment. And everyone knows Dean Holen. I won't introduce him in detail, except to say that he is a Stanford product at the bachelor's level, master's and PhD at Oregon, and continues to publish. And I brought the list of current publications with me, and I've talked too long, so I won't read them, but he does continue to publish with research in his discipline. So please help me welcome Dean Holen. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Um, actually, I've got to tell you that it, it, it's, a, it's a kind of an honor to be the first person in this uh, series because I get to the first say. I'm kind of wondering what the fifth one down the line is going to have to say about all of this. I asked Jim uh, uh, why he gave me this honor, and uh, he was quite forthright and I think quite scholarly in his analysis of it. He said, oh, hell, I looked around the room and you had the best hand. <laughs> I do appreciate the opportunity to uh, spend some time with you here this afternoon to talk about emerging concepts of scholarship in higher education environments. And uh, while I recognize that we have individuals from across the campus here, uh, I would like to particularly address my remarks to my colleagues in the college because um, it's on them that I believe that uh, uh, my feelings and comments may uh, have the most impact. You know, the researchers in our field say that the absolute worst way to uh, promote learning in anyone is to just talk at them. Uh, <clears throat> obviously, institutions of higher education didn't uh, earn their uh, well-deserved reputation across the world for their quality um, <clears throat> by their teaching performance. Uh, talking at people seems to be one of our big strengths. Um, I decided today to spend my time though showcasing the uh, work of six of our faculty colleagues in the College of Education. Um, I guess six talking, seven talking heads are better than one. Uh, after they have presented, we will entertain uh, questions and comments from those of you in the audience. First, I think it's probably useful and instructive to explore what we mean when we say scholarship. Uh, in its simplest way, I, I thought, well, I should at least go to the dictionary, and I did. And it said that a scholar is a learned person. 
and then that scholarship is the character, qualities, and attainments of the scholar. I must say <clears throat> that I'm reminded of a controversy in the 1960s among my psychometric colleagues. There was a, there was a tremendous amount of controversy revolving around nature, nurture, and what the meaning of intelligence really was. And so they impaneled a group of the leading psychometrists from throughout the world, and they asked them to uh, help us understand intelligence. And after meeting for some, uh, some long period of time, these prominent theorists emerged to tell us that they had decided that you should understand that it, intelligence is whatever it is that an intelligence test measures. In a like way, apparently, scholarship is whatever it is that scholars do. Frankly, that's a definition that I don't find all that difficult to accept. But for most fields, and especially those represented by professional colleges, I think it's useful to assign the label of scholarship to the activity of, the activity of scholars identifying and defining important questions using their experience and their intuition and their intellect and their learnings to propose significant solutions to these important questions and then testing those solutions in meaningful environments. Certainly I do not wish to mislead anyone about the nature of scholarship in the field of education with my emphasis today. The work of our college is done by about 70 full-time tenure-track faculty members and all of them are 100% on instructional budget lines. But in the five-year period that led up to our just completed accreditation visit, this faculty published approximately 300 research articles and books. They authored proposals resulting in nearly $12 million in grants and contracts, and they serve as the editors of six research journals. In short, the faculty subscribe fully to traditional paradigms of scholarship. But clearly, the limited approach to scholarship taken by professional schools of education across the entire country over the past decades has been seriously flawed. In fact, I contend that our misreading of the need for alternative acceptable paradigms for the exploration of serious problems came perilously close to rendering colleges of education obsolete in our universities across the nation. As the locus for preparation of school personnel shifted from what was essentially <clears throat> completely at normal schools to more comprehensive universities, particularly the research universities, pressures on faculty to obtain a doctorate and to compete for professional advancement grew rapidly. You know, in the normal school, having a master's degree was frequently the terminal expected degree for training teachers. Almost uniformly, the broad discipline embraced an epistemology which stemmed from logical positivism and linked problem definition and solution to experimentation and the increasing popularity of science-like methodologies. Educational researchers found significant education problems too messy and too complex and too unmanageable for experimentation but their journals demanded increasingly pristine methodologies. Instead of invoking alternatives to science-like research, university education faculty abandoned the public schools, both politically and intellectually. We chose to admire well-defined and controlled research on fundamentally trivial matters in very unschool-like settings. And we did that over the exploration of significant matters in real schools. Not very surprisingly, many university education faculty came to regard teachers, and even the people who only prepared teachers, as second-class citizens. While school people came to regard university faculty as too theoretical, fundamentally uninformed, and basically irrelevant. In the meantime, with all this quibbling, our knowledge of school environments, school problems, and school performance failed to keep pace with the many challenges. 
Now, please don't misunderstand my position. The methods of science have served science well. In fact, they have served many disciplines, including education, well when properly applied. But research, and more broadly scholarship, does not belong to science alone. As Elliot Eisner, professor of art and education at Stanford University has noted, this question, what should count as research, leads to a very deep agenda. It is also an agenda with high stakes, for it pertains to matters of legitimacy, authority, and ultimately to who possesses the power to publish and promote. Issues of epistemology have political ramifications as well as intellectual ones. Certainly some others in the university have recognized and accepted this premise for as long as universities have existed. Our colleagues in art, English, philosophy, and many other disciplines have never abandoned scholarship to science. My concern is that many faculty in professional education at K-State and throughout the world did so. I contend that slavish acceptance of so limiting an epistemology cannot continue if we are to mean anything in the crucial attempts to rescue and resuscitate schooling. As I said, I have invited six of my colleagues here with me this afternoon, who I believe exemplify the risk-taking involved in expanding our understanding of scholarship. Each of them has demonstrated success in what nearly all of us in the academy would accept as scholarship. But today, however, I have asked them here to speak briefly about their application of knowledge, experience, and creativity to address significant problems in professional education. Approaches to scholarship which look and feel a lot more like teaching and service than they do to propositional inquiry. First, I'd like to introduce Dr. Robert Shoup. For many years, schooling's dirty little secret was the magnitude of the impact on the personal development and the learning environment of sexual harassment. Dr. Shoup has explored and developed high-impact approaches to revealing and reducing sexual harassment in our schools. I'd like to call him Bob. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate the opportunity to spend a couple moments sharing some of the recent um, activities that I've been involved with. And primarily, I'm, I'm motivated by trying to deal with um, real problems and important issues as they present themselves in the school. And the schema that I do that in um, crosses several areas that historically have been identified as specific research disciplines. Um, to give one example, Mike asked me to speak about dealing with the issues of of sexual harassment as they present themselves in the public school. Um, the way that might present itself to me would be on a, a problem-centered research where I'll work with the school district and they're basically asking several questions. One of the questions they're asking is, how do we keep our children safe? Um, any of you who are parents or who are working in the schools realize that the climate that children are in today is much different than the climate we would hope that they would be in. And sexual abuse, sexual assault, and sexual harassment are very serious issues in the school. Um, every national research study that's been done says that um, in most schools between 60 and 80 percent of the children are sexually harassed and 20 percent of them so seriously that it significantly impacts on the ability of them to learn. So as I work with schools, the two types of questions they ask is, one, is what type of practice do we have to have in our school to keep our children safe? But a parallel question that sometimes seems almost um, the antithesis of that is, and what should we do to make sure we're not sued? And if we are sued, that we don't lose. And these two issues are not necessarily compatible issues because sometimes institutions ask questions about liability first rather than protection. So as I work with these organizations, I identified very clear issues of what should schools be doing relating to sexual harassment prevention and what do the courts ask them to do. So that problem-based, problem-centered education then leads me into the area that oftentimes is referred to as policy studies or straight legal research. And what I do at that point is attempt to find out what the statutory and judicial 
reasoning is right now today. And that's what's oftentimes difficult because the practitioners that are out in the school trying to run our schools aren't involved in day-by-day -day court action in most cases, nor are they involved in reading litigation on a daily basis. So I attempt to find out what are the courts saying? What are schools expected to do? And what kind of liabilities are, are existing for educators? Um, we look at national standards. We look at uh, judicial decisions. And we look at um, various statutory regulations. Then that leads me into the, to the aspect that, that may be different than what some traditional researchers do, and that's research and development or curriculum development. Um, for example, I've been asked by the National Middle School Association, the National School Board Association, Sunburst Communication, to develop curriculum and media to help teachers get up to speed on what the current research is. They're not likely to be reading law journals, but what we did is produce video programs that are very accurate in terms of the standards of the profession and very accurate in terms of the current judicial reasoning. And those video programs are now being used in about 2,000 schools across the country on a daily basis to help children become safer, but also to let schools understand if the child is harmed, what are the exposures to liability that that school has. And then going through the research and development aspect and developing the media and the curriculum, then it moves into the fourth area, which is really, to me, one of the most exciting, but also one of the most um, frightening aspects, and that's expert testimony. Um, I'm, I'm asked to provide testimony. Currently, in, I've, I've worked with 25 federal district courts in about 15 states where a case gets to court. And then I'm asked, as an expert, to bring my research to bear on the judicial process to inform the judge and the jury what's reasonable. What is really reasonable? Can you protect every child from every event? If you can't, then what kind of behaviors can we exhibit to make sure most children are protected most of the time? So in real live active cases, I bring the research that I've developed in the schools to basically let the court understand how do schools operate, what do schools look like, and is it reasonable to do X, Y, or Z? And as I give that testimony, the thing that is most exciting to me is then that testimony becomes embedded in the decisions of the judiciary, and then that becomes the standard, which feeds back to our first question, which is what are the standards in the school? So I'm continually trying to let the judiciary understand what schools are really like, and that's based on the research from the various organizations, and at the same time, bring the research that's being created by the judiciary into the schools. The two specific questions that they're asking now, for example, are the issues of vicarious liability and the issue of respondeat superior. And what that typically means is, if you have a teacher rape a child in a school, there's no question that that person should be arrested and incarcerated. And that happens. But then the next question is, is the school liable to the child for what happened to that child as a result of being placed in the hands of this person that harmed him? And so the issue is, how much liability does the school have for the actors that it employs? And on a daily basis, I'm working with school districts helping them understand how to translate that theory into practice, and then hopefully helping the judiciary understand what the practice truly is, and trying to make a connection between a scholar and a practitioner, and feeding one upon the other, and hopefully in a way that can influence both in a positive way. Thank you. Actually, I wasn't uh, so sure that I liked sexual harassment as, a, as an issue until, uh, until two times Rush Limbaugh picked on Bob on his radio show. And I figured anybody that Rush is after has got to be all right. <laughs> Second, I'd like to introduce Dr. David Thompson. Ironically, in most states, universities, public schools, and prisons command the lion's share of state tax money. Equity and efficiency in school finances become a key matter for courts and legislatures alike. Dr. Thompson has developed an expertise which allows him to impact problem solving in school finance across the nation. David. Thank you, Dean Holan. I appreciate the opportunity to address my colleagues from across the campus of Kansas State University. 
As a preface to my remarks, I would like to strongly endorse what Dean Holland said earlier regarding being a part of the College of Education. In my estimation, it represents a significant and multifaceted conceptualization of scholarship. As a department chair, it was my privilege to recently report to Dean Holland that more than 200 works, seven national, seven national awards, and a series of other activities and honors had attributed to my particular department. And what I wish to be very clear about as we address a different nature of scholarship today is that I sincerely believe that our college endorses and believes in the value of good research within traditional definitions of the term. At the same time, however, scholarship is more broadly defined and is a characteristic that is very graphic, I believe, within the College of Education. I was fundamentally asked to address you today because my work moves beyond the traditional dissemination of research, which I've certainly participated in over a period of time by moving into the arena of public policy. <clears throat> my field, as Dean Holland referenced, is the funding of education, more traditionally called the area of school finance. It's a field that, in my view, is very deeply entrenched in both quantitative analysis of fiscal fairness and also a field that uses such analysis to impact federal and state policy. And it's fundamentally my task to describe to you how that crossover occurs in ways that my field is regarded as scholarship in, by impacting the fiscal realities of public schools. States for a very long time have been interested in the funding of public education. But it's simply a fact that the public treasury, public attitude, and political realities have never allowed those events to move quite as fast as scholarly knowledge of what fiscal resource equity is about. As an illustration, in about 1875, approximately 25% of school revenues were provided by the states. It's also a fact that 100 years later, in 1972, only about 25% of school funding uh, resources were provided by the state of Kansas to local school districts. And that's despite longstanding evidence among scholarly people that the impact of resources on school district realities is an important one that has a tremendous impact on low aid and widely disparate tax bases. It also has to be said, however, quite frankly, that by 1977, the state of Kansas had moved very quickly to catch up with other parts of the nation to the point that where today as we speak, the state of Kansas is providing in excess of 70% of resources that school districts have available to them. What I'm here to suggest to you today is that that is a phenomenon that is fundamentally attributable to a form of broadened scholarship that has created a sensitivity to fiscal equity and an awareness of the impact of resources on student achievement. The kind of change that I'm describing very briefly is the result of melding traditional research with scholarly testimony in legislative and judicial settings. That's a path that can be traced to very early in this century with the work of Elwood Coverley in New York State, in which he began to notice that there were significant fiscal disparities among school districts in that particular state. He argued that equal educational opportunity has to include equal educational funding opportunities. And while many of his ideas have been discredited in the years that have followed, his work has taken root in both legislative and judicial halls, leading to a whole field of school finance formula development. Beginning with him, school finance experts have testified before legislatures and before courts seeking to correct state aid deficiencies or to improve um, distributional equity methodologies. That kind of testimony does not really forsake traditional research because it pulls upon massive data sets. It applies traditional sophisticated statistical and economic research tools to estimate relationships between a host of variables such as revenue, tax base, expenditure, and achievement. But it moves beyond publication of that literature because these kinds of studies have been of tremendous interest to federal and state governments alike. For example, in the early 1970s, Congress funded the National Education Finance Project. As a consequence of that, there have been tremendous, massive state funding reforms that came about during those years. States themselves have undertaken individual studies of their own work voluntarily. For example, in the past number of years, my work has included advising uh, legislatures, state agencies, and school districts in approximately a dozen states. As a specific example of which I speak, 
In 1990, my testimony before the Kansas legislature resulted in changes in the school aid funding formula in the state of Kansas. As I testified regarding the performance of the old School District Equalization Act of 1972 and urged a new formula that would require familiar things to everyone that is in this room, such as a unified or rather a uniform statewide property tax rate, weightings within the formula to recognize cost variables and to allow local option budget or local option tax leeway. When such groups as these, fundamentally education agencies and legislatures in states across the nation seek help, they are fundamentally looking for a form of scholarship that we identify as data analysis and expert conclusions about state aid formula equity in the belief, supported or otherwise, that money makes a difference in children's education. But due to a lack of political readiness, the impact of that kind of scholarship is very often incomplete. And that opens an ent another entire venue in the form of expert testimony in courts of law. Now, while that's very unpleasant and it's very adversarial, the legal system has been a battle over school aid for a great number of years. In fact, we could trace it back over 100 years if we had the time, and we could move it very carefully into the present. But the upshot of it is that in the last number of years, more approximately 20, to be uh, approximately exact, 49 out of the 50 states in the United States have gone through legal challenges to their methods of funding education, and nearly every state has reinvented how schools are funded. The impact of a broader scholarship is very powerful in venues of which I speak. Fundamentally, I reference that while courts are swayed by activist and or minimalist constructions of state education articles, they still have to rely on demonstrable facts and respected opinion. And data analysis and expert opinion form the meat of that kind of analysis in which opposing experts attack one another in a court of law in order to discredit the other particular point of view and to convince a court to a particular point of view. As a specific case in point, my trial testimony on behalf of the defendant state of South Dakota sought to refute plaintiff claims of illegitimate variability in per-pupil revenues, which plaintiffs unsuccessfully tried to link to low student achievement. My analysis simply held that there was nothing conceptually wrong from a theoretical perspective with the state aid formula, that plaintiffs erred by comparing extremely small districts to very large districts, that plaintiffs were ignoring large federal revenues that were tracking to Native American populations, and that the same analysis that plaintiffs had performed, if it were performed on groups reordered by decile analysis based on district size, would reveal entirely opposite results. That was an argument that was accepted by the court ultimately in holding for the defendant state. The arguments that I've just described currently define a significant part of scholarship in my field today. There are scholars like David Monk at Cornell who pursue the nearly psychoanalytical microeconomic linkages between resource inputs and student achievement. And there are others like Eric Hanushek at Rochester who argue that an entire generation of traditional production function research has provided no evidence that money matters at all in children's education. But then there are other scholars like myself in a broader definition of scholarship who provide legislative and judicial testimony regarding fairness in school aid formulas, and it is an arena in which money is seen as the spoils of war and in which the winners and losers walk off or lose hundreds of millions of dollars. That is a debate that I've observed is couched in very moral tones, but it's also underguarded by very traditional research, and it is played out on a dramatic stage. It has framed scholarship in my discipline for the past 20 years, and I can say with a high degree of confidence that it frames the future as well. It is my contention today that one definition of scholarship is to make the persuasive case that traditional research has to be joined with a living environment for the purpose of far-reaching political consequences to impact and shape current policy debates by raising the technical level of knowledge, by increasing sensitivity to fiscal equity, and by informing and guiding legislatures, public agencies, and courts on matters of grave policy concern. It's certainly the truth, I believe, that school funding would be many years behind where, it's where it is today if it were not for such scholarship as I described. And it's my belief that scholars of the future in my field will be increasingly called upon to link both traditional research to the policy arena in ways that change the fiscal and educational realities of public schools. In essence, the practical application of traditional research findings to real world problems. Thank you.
Thank you, David. Third, I'd like to introduce Dr. Linda Thurston. You know, families in crisis are a key factor in school difficulties for children. Dr. Thurston's work at bringing assistance to families by using technological solutions to reach an incredibly wide range of clients and service providers has resulted in millions of dollars of grant support to the university. It is also the case that just uh, in the last few days, Dr. Thurston was invited by Vice President Gore to be one of three national experts to speak uh, from his office on, on child welfare issues. It's my pleasure now to introduce Dr. Linda Thurston. Linda? Thank you, Mike. During the last five and a half years, a team of Kansas State University faculty and staff and students have been working to produce and evaluate an interactive multimedia educational program for human service workers in the state of Kansas. Our goal was to provide for those workers an opportunity for meaningful and systematic education that would help them deal with the most difficult problems that our society faces. Child welfare issues such as the severance of parental rights, child abuse, child neglect, adolescent mental health issues such as eating disorders, and suicide. Value and role conflicts on the job at the office and working with parents and children with disabilities. We chose to address this by using interactive multimedia as the tool for delivering education because of many unique attributes of multimedia education. The state wanted training that would be timely, and efficient, and that would not be expert dependent. That means that they wouldn't have to wait for a critical mass of people to be trained for. An expert from Topeka would go out or to bring everybody in uh, to Topeka, thereby incurring large uh, travel expenses. They also wanted evidence that their people in the field actually uh, were learning something and it would increase their competency base. In the first year of our project, we did focus groups with the professionals in the field and found out that they wanted something entirely different. Um, they wanted uh, to learn in a way that respect, respected the complexity of the work they did, all the different things they did, and the complexity of the issues that they dealt with, especially uh, those in rural areas. They also wanted the information in a timely manner. So if they were going to go testify about a child abuse case in court, they wanted to know right then uh, how to prepare for that. And they also wanted us to know that they were very dissatisfied with the current uh, status of professional development in their field. And what we wanted to do then was to meet the needs of the state and the people in the field by, by using an alternative to the traditional uh, in-service workshop or the traditional class with a sage on the stage telling people what to do. We wanted to develop something that would be interesting, something that would be adaptable for all the adult learners who used this method. Whether they be a brand new uh, graduate or an undergraduate, or whether they'd been in the field for 30 years. We wanted a method that would meet their individual needs, their individual differences, their individual experiences, and the time uh, amount that they had to do this in the field. They didn't have half days. They had 20 minutes, 10 minutes, uh, 30 minutes during the day to work on this. So what we did was pull together our, the knowledge that we had about the characteristics of adult learners, and about educational methodology and about the use of technology in education to develop a program called Building Family Foundations. Building Family Foundations is a 10-module self-directed and self-paced multimedia interactive curriculum that has been placed around the state at, at at least 50 sites for the use by parents, 
human service providers, and others. We're going to show you just a couple of pieces out of one of the modules, family-based treatment strategies, so that you can see some of the aspects of the methods that we used. The curriculum has uh, a video, vi uh, a series of 10 video discs. It has one CD, that's CD-ROM, that's got all the programming on it, and it's got uh, a paper-based material workbook that can be used by the practitioner. In the series Building Family Foundations. This is just a double check to make sure that the learner has the right video disc in. You can see here how, how it's been individualized for people. Each learner has his or her, her own um, floppy with their name in it so that their data and their progress through each of the modules can be tracked so they can come back to where they were, they can go back and look at their scores, they can keep track of seat time, they can trade in some of that information for CEUs. Family-based treatment strategies in the series Building Family Foundations. Family-based treatment strategies were developed based on an eco-behavioral approach to treating various family problems. This approach views the family as an interdependent and interactive sure system that similar to the that the speaker uh, talked for very long, module, there was also the opportunity for the learner to check the verbatim and read along or see the words as well as hear the words. How to teach these strategies to parents, providing them with the tools and the skills for improving parent-child interactions and overall family functioning. We always do advanced organizers so that the learner knows exactly what's coming and can make choices about where they will go. The, the, the map that's one of the learning tools that is on each of the modules shows the different aspects of the module so that the learner can go through those in order. The learner can take a different path. The learner could, could go, um, for example, in treatment strategies and go talk, learn about coping skills, come back to that before a visit with a certain family. Uh, or go to whatever level he or she wants to go to to learn a specific thing. Uh, systematic teaching is one of the methodologies that is presented on this particular module, of uh, family-based treatment strategies. And we found when we did our original beta test that many of the people who would be using this program uh, were very naive about technology. So uh, we have prompts for everything they need to do, like, are you sure you want to do this? Uh, it's time to, to look, uh, it's time to turn the page in your workbook, or it's time to, to look at the video disc or put in a different video disc. Demonstrations, coached practice, feedback, and independent practice. The modules use an, uh, a variety of, of text, of video, of audio, of animation, of interactive tests, She's doing better. Or forms to but fill out. Uh, one of the attributes of this methodology is that the learner can actually watch somebody teaching. This is a teacher and a parent. Watch that conference go on and, and not only uh, hear about what the skill is and read about that specific specific family competency, but also see it being done. You notice they can, they can go backwards and look at it again and again if they want to. They can move forward through it if they decide they don't want to see that. But it's very learner driven. The learner decides exactly what uh, he or she will learn in what order and how fast to go through the material. This 10-module program is in 50 sites around the state. As I said, it's also being used in the undergraduate program here at Kansas State University in social work, and it's being used in the graduate program in special education. Uh, not only is this program innovative because there's, there's nothing else like it in the country that is specifically competency-based for human service providers and other people who, who deal with child and family issues, it's also unique because it was developed with a collaborative effort of uh, two departments here at the university, two colleges, uh, several different entities working not only with the people on the front lines to see, the way, see what they wanted to have and the best way for them to use the methods, 
but also with the state on what they think, what they thought they wanted. Uh, the process took five and a half years. There was a, about a 15 to 25 steps to developing each of the, the 15 modules. And the development of the, the methodology uh, using our content and, and working with the adults with whom we work has been proven very successful. We've done control group studies that show that, that the learners who have used this program not only are more confident uh, about their use of these skills with uh, real life situations in their offices with families, but also that they um, know more, uh, they, they, they are more prepared, and that compared to the control group, they have a lot more uh, interest and motivation and skills to deal with some of those very difficult issues. The methodology has also been published in uh, a book and a couple of articles about how we went about developing the whole uh, project. When we first began, there wasn't very much written on how to, to design a multidisciplinary program with a lot of different people uh, and a lot of different content. And we have um, uh, learned how to do that and have presented that model so that other people can develop their own interactive multimedia for adult learners and come out with the same outcomes that we have. Fourth, I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Socorro Herrera. Throughout Kansas, in the country, the numbers of children attending America's schools without much in the way of English language skills are sharply increasing. Frankly, most teachers have little idea how to work with these children. So often the child essentially sits in the back of the room with picture books until they can be passed on to another teacher who also doesn't know what to do with them. All too often, these otherwise able children end up in the law enforcement books as statistics. Other institutions have tried to provide teacher in-service in ESL a class at a time to, to uh, little avail. Frankly, it's extremely difficult for institutions to find instructors uh, given their demand in the public school system. We simply haven't been able to address the problem in much of any state. Dr. Herrera has designed and implemented a high-quality distance-delivered solution which is already being accessed by nearly 400 teachers. Socorro? Hello. I'd like to share a little bit about our program, which has proven to be extremely exciting and gets more exciting all the time. As Dean Holland uh, has shared with you, in the state of Kansas, we have a tremendous need in working with culturally and linguistically different students. And yet the qualified personnel to teach uh, educators already in the field and those that are pre-service are very limited. Uh, so the demand has uh, increased and yet the qualified personnel has decreased. So based on the need of the very rapidly changing demographics in the state of Kansas as well as in the Midwest, and particularly in rural districts that for many, many years had not ever seen one limited English proficient student and practically overnight have 30 or 40, um, the challenge became to develop a program that was rigorous, that provided these educators with more than recipes for uh, working with culturally and linguistically different students. As we began to develop the program, we reviewed the literature on distance education as well as looked at other models that were being provided across the country. And we found that we were going to be very innovative and very new because there was very little out there. What we did find is that most of the literature on professional development identified four specific benchmarks that a program should be um, developed by. We looked at providing these districts with site-specific information. So in helping to bridge that theory practice gap, we wanted to provide educators with the theory necessary for uh, their practice, but also work with them in applying this practice. The way that our program is set up is that we have developed, uh, we go on site at the beginning of the semester, 
and meet the educators. We learn about their district. We learn about their needs. And then we provide them with eight videotapes as well as uh, information on the type of activities that they should be involved in once they have completed viewing the videotape. We felt that it was critical to the development of these teachers that they work in collaborative groups because in their complex environments, it's through dialogue that they will be able to come up with solutions based on the information that we provide and the questions that they raise as they are involved in learning. The collaborative groups have proven to be one of the most successful aspects of our program in that educators begin to challenge one another on the philosophies that they've held, the beliefs that they've held about second language learners. Um, they begin to ask questions of their administrators about what is educationally sound for the students. Uh, for example, in many districts, paraprofessionals with almost, with very little training had been in charge of, in, the, the inst in the instruction of these students, and yet that is totally against the law. In districts, in wanting to comply not only with the law, but also provide educationally sound instruction for their culturally and linguistically different students, have called and said, this is very exciting for the first time in many districts in the history of our district uh, where we've had many one-shot, one-time workshops. For the first time, teachers are asking questions. And for the first time, they're wanting to review the literature. They're actually saying, maybe there is something in this theory stuff, <laughs> which has been exciting for us because we do come across that resistance about too much theory and tell me how to. And we keep saying, we can't tell you how to. There isn't a recipe. If you look at Wichita, that has 57 languages, 30 in one school, and you look at Garden City, and they say they're pretty much in the same uh, boat. And then you go to Elkhart, and they may have all Spanish-speaking students. So no one approach is going to work. It is up to you as educators to review the literature and to decide for yourself what it is that it, that's going to work for you. We've challenged them to begin to look at cultural sensitivity issues and go beyond just integrating the curriculum, but rather beginning again to explore the literature, explore the theory, and apply it. As we have worked with almost 20, well, I guess now it's over 25 school districts, and as Dean Holen has uh, shared, 400 students, we've only had 17% uh, attrition rate, which we feel is tremendous success. We are beginning to have superintendents say, this may be a new approach to professional development where teachers get ongoing staff development that is provided through distance education, and that's where our staff development monies can go rather than bringing in the experts for one day to tell us how to. Um, so that has all been very excited. We have definitely grounded this in the whole concept of lifelong and self-directed learning. When we first went out to meet with the superintendents to ask about what problems are you having in your district, what questions arise when you're working with culturally and linguistically different students, and this is how we can respond to your need, and we can adapt and modify as we collect data uh, after the implementation of the first course, we had some superintendents who said, our teachers cannot watch a video and learn. And we replied, if we're going to believe that educators, that as adults, we are going to be self-directed, lifelong learners, because the complex issues are not going to go away, if we're going to believe that technology is going to inform our instruction, our practice, we must believe, like Osterman and Kopkamp tell us, that teachers have the desire to be professionals, teachers have the desire to grow. It's just that for too long, maybe they haven't been provided the avenues and the collaborative groups are going to give them the chance. And now we have administrators who will say to us, you know these teachers are talking in the lounge about ESL students and what to do with ESL students and what are you doing with them? <laughs> and we say we're providing them the opportunity to have dialogue about something that is specific to their needs. And so as we come to the third semester of the implementation of the English as a Second Language program, 
we have adapted and modified. We've asked questions and um, through email and uh, homepage and other avenues, we are helping teachers begin to see that they, the resources are in their hands and that we at the university can serve to begin to problem solve, pose questions, and begin to collect data that it's process thinking, that it's, that it's all about process thinking, and that there are a whole lot of different ways that they can gain information once they have the tools and they have the skills. And so one of the things I keep telling Dean Holland, we may have 700 students pretty soon. What are we going to do with all of them? But he says, don't worry, we'll find a way. <laughs> Thank you very much. Actually, I might uh, tell you that, that uh, when our NK team was here, uh, they are told these days not just to criticize institutions as was their uh, past practice, but to also uh, make some positive kinds of statements about the institution, but to do so sparingly. Uh, one of the programs that they decided to cite as a national exemplary model was Socorro's uh, ESL program until in discussions they discovered that it's against their bylaws to cite a program that hasn't had people go all the way through it. Uh, this is a 15-hour graduate program, and, and uh, uh, so we haven't finished any folks completely yet in this, but uh, it certainly will end up being uh, cited as one of the outstanding programs um, in the country. Uh, fifth, I'd like to introduce Dr. Tweed Ross. The, the exploding demand for technology training for school teachers uh, both in the schools and in our pre-service program has proved exceptionally hard for the college to meet. Uh, you all know about limited laboratory spaces and uh, constrained equipment budgets, and they certainly um, run, uh, cause us a considerable amount of problems in servicing all of the people uh, who say they have a need for technology training. Dr. Ross um, turned to the technologies themselves to provide solutions uh, to this problem, and we now enroll as many as 400 students a semester uh, using just one laboratory with 25 computer workstations. Sweet. I'm going to leave the monitor run here beside us so you can see at least a little bit of the product that came out of, of this effort. I uh, left the sound turned off but at least you'll be able to see them on what came out of the effort. This is a little closer to home project, which, because it serves our undergraduate students here in the College of Ed, and I was excited when Dr. Holland gave me the opportunity to work with it. I must in fairness say, though, I'm only representative of a, a group of other people that helped me with this project, and I think it'd probably be unfair on their behalf to take it as though it was all mine, because I had a great lot of help. Um, what we're setting in motion, or what we've set in motion, is a long-range program, and this, this program is really the second iteration of the Instructional Media and Technology Program in the College of Education. It wasn't too long ago, I can remember, as an undergraduate at Kansas State, where I learned film strips or projectors, overhead transparencies, and 16 millimeters. I haven't seen... Uh, a whole lot of film strip projectors and 16 millimeters recently. But we have moved into a lot of electronic technologies, and we sought to, to use technology to solve technology. But we had some serious problems. In our problems, while it sounds like a, an unusual problem, we had more students than we could accommodate in our limited lab facilities because our instructional media program is very hands-on based. We expect our students to actually do the sort of things that we expect. And with limited lab facilities, we had many students. And what was happening was we had students who couldn't take the course in a timely fashion. They couldn't finish the course and progress on with their degrees and get out of here because we could essentially only accommodate about 200 students a semester. 
doesn't take long. If you've got 20 machines and you've got a two-hour course, uh, and how many you multiply that out by the week, and still leave time for the students to work in the labs and be able to work on their assignments, we simply were delaying students sometimes in their timely progress to their bachelor's degree. And more than that, as we trained students, as we got students up to speed in using spreadsheets and word processing and data-based management and multimedia materials, we found that our labs were getting more crowded because we had more people wanting to use the labs for other assignments. We also were using graduate teaching assistants, which we're doing a lot of them, we're doing a very fine job, but there was, as you have six, five to six graduate teaching assistants during the semester, there would be variations in the quality of instruction. And then the third problem we frankly found was interesting is we had a lot of students came with a wide range of abilities as far as technology goes. Many of our students came out of high schools and were thoroughly conversant with instructional technologies at, at the lower levels. They could go through the word processing, the spreadsheets, the databases, and to ask them to sit in class and have me or even the best instructor in the world go over and over and over things that they had been doing in high school was probably essentially unfair and was a waste of their time. And we had these kind of wide range abilities. At the other end, we had students who found that the course was very difficult. And if we moved along at a steady pace, that they found it very difficult to keep up. And so we sought out with some serious goals to, to attack these, these problems. And we looked at it and we set out three specific goals. One of them was to accommodate students with a wide range of abilities, to let students work at their own pace. If they could do the materials, if they could move along, let them move along. If, on the other hand, they needed greater instruction, how could we accommodate that? How could we sit there and not have everybody held up while student after student asked the same question on how to actually do something over and over again? Two, to ensure a consistency in the instruction. So we actually knew what was going on in the classroom, so to speak, at this, all the time. And third, to make sure that all the students who wanted to take this course could, in fact, enroll in this course in what amounted to their time frame, not uh, because they simply couldn't get in. So how did we set out to do this? Our first thought on this was to develop a series of videotapes. And what you see is part of the product of that videotape production. This was a platform we felt practically all of our students would be able to have access to. Many of them knew how it, it was not a technology they would have to learn. Those few that did not have videotape access, we provided VCR machines in our labs so that they could actually watch the assignment being done. And I don't know where we are right now, but you may see one of those where a student is actually doing the assignment. So they can see that. And they can play this over as, as many times as they need, much time as they need. To do that, we set up a pretty extensive team. And I think a team is the only way to go about this project. Well, I, I would like to claim some expertise in technology here. I, I must admit, I had a, a very high quality group of people who worked with me in developing these materials. We upgraded our facilities significantly, and we added some high quality capturing equipment, and we added some high quality editing equipment so that we could edit these tapes as we went. Now this is important, because as we have gone through this process, we have had to edit and edit and edit and re-edit in a timely fashion. Uh, I don't know, I like to use the example, how many of you have had, tried to write the directions to making a peanut butter sandwich? And if you try to write those directions down, it is very, very difficult. And you leave steps out and you have to rewrite and rewrite on those directions. We developed a set of scripts. One of the things we found very quickly in it that students still needed some sort of paper document to hold in their hands as they sat at the computer and work. It was difficult for them to watch the videotape and then leave that and go sit at the machine and work. And so we developed a, a, a rather comprehensive manual, and this is the product of that, to do that. We were also able 
in that same context to increase our lab hours. That our students now can have a great deal more access to our lab equipment than they had ever had before. And finally, we were concerned about how are we going to assess this. And we have, have worked extensively on assessment. We use a portfolio assessment uh, with a, a quality check in, in having two examinations. And we have used an extensive portfolio system. And we're just delighted with, the, quite frankly, the work that has come out of this. Uh, in that thing, you might ask, what have been the results of it? Well, we have accommodated the students. We have 400 students enrolled this semester, 400, give or take a few, uh, which is nearly double what we could handle in any previous semester. We had 400 students in the spring semester. Uh, our labs, frankly, are still crowded. But when you stop to think that we have now 800 students, if you just count the last two semesters, that want to use our labs for their materials, our student achievement, I think we can confidently say, has remained consistent. The perception of the course has been positive. They have liked the opportunity to work at their own pace. And I thought I should only fair to share with you that as I, this is a work in progress, it's a research work in progress, because we are in the midst, quite frankly, of rewriting the course again. In the fall of 98, we not only hope to be able to offer this course on campus uh, for students, but we hope to be able to offer it in a distance mode uh, for students who might wish to take it in other arenas. Thank you. These things are uh, always a learning process for all of us. One of the, one of the uh, things that we discovered is that, that uh, it's really inconvenient for a lot of students uh, to use videotape and then have to use a computer because they don't have them in the same place. Um, and, and so Tweeden and some of his folks are uh, converting the entire course uh, to be on disk so that they can actually do the whole thing on the disk. That'll make it a lot easier for us to do our distance uh, uh, courses without having to worry so much about their access to the right kinds of equipment. Finally, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Gail Schroer. Uh, as, uh, as our college and a few others came to uh, recognize the issues that I mentioned uh, much earlier uh, with respect to our having grown so far apart, uh, we came to recognize that school improvement would only occur uh, with simultaneous changes in teacher education and in teacher in-service. But a model was needed to accommodate reform across the entire system. Dr. Schroer and her colleagues have played a leadership role in establishing an elementary education program which has received nat national acclaim for its comprehensiveness, its innovation, and its quality. Gail? Thank you, Mike. Um, what I'd like to do today, I was thinking being the last person in a long, illustrious group of speakers here that uh, perhaps what I'd do would be a little bit different. I'd like to start off in the similar way of just telling you a little bit about what it is that I do that I consider to be scholarship. But then I'd also like, and provide some examples of that, but I'd also at the same time like to share with you some of my thoughts about what's unique or, or perhaps non-traditional about my scholarship, and then end with some thoughts on um, what it means to do sh scholarship in a field such as mine, and also um, share with you some of my thoughts about how to judge quality of scholarship that is similar to what it is that I do. First off, um, one of the things that, that I always tell people about what it is that I try to do is that I have one theme and one goal to, to my work, and that is that I see myself as an educator trying to improve our educational system. Um, within that, that context, typically what I try to do is sort of a four-step problem-solving process. Uh, the first thing that I try to do is to identify problems within the educational system. 
Now, generally, I'm working with teachers, administrators, parents, students, community members. Well, I try to do that. And I don't consider that to be terribly innovative or unique. When I look in my field, there's lots of people within my field that have identified lots of problems within education. But as, as I do that, I think that it is a blend of both research and also what I might consider service. Uh, the second step that I try to be involved with is to work with other people in proposing solutions to some of those problems. Now, that might be a little bit more innovative, although, again, if you look at, across the field, there's lots of people that have proposed some solutions for some of what ails education currently. And I see that as both a research agenda for myself and also a, a service agenda. The third step, though, is one that I really found that there was a need for. When I, when I looked across the things that were being said about education, one of the things that, that I found very little on were people actually trying to make changes in schools, to implement what they believed might work, to go out and try things out. And so the third step for me is to become involved with other educators in implementing the proposed solutions. To me, I'd say that that is kind of a blend of, of service, teaching, and it also, though, becomes a part of the research agenda. Then the last step is to evaluate the effectiveness and the usefulness of the solutions that we've tried out. And again, that could probably come back to, to research and service. Um, the reason that I gave that sort of four-step process is because I'd like to begin with talking about what I see as unique or uh, perhaps non-traditional in what it is that I do. The first one is the way that, that I believe my work blends teaching, service, and research. When I went through uh, promotion and tenure, when I go through merit review every year, I'm always told to categorize my materials according to research, teaching, and service. I find that difficult, if not impossible, to do because of the way they, they flow together and overlap with one another. Um, the second perhaps a uh, different thing about what it is that I do is the problem-solving, action-oriented focus, what some people might call theory into practice. I'm not only interested in, in the generation of new knowledge, but equally important, I'm interested in implementing that knowledge within realistic classroom settings to see what works, what doesn't work, to see what's feasible, what's not feasible, and to move from there. Uh, the third unique aspect would be the collaborative nature of my work. There's little, if anything, that I do within my teaching, research, and service that isn't done with others. Uh, my collaboration has involved people from arts and sciences. It's involved teachers, administrators, parents, children, our undergraduate students, our graduate students. And then the last thing about it, I suppose, is what I would call the multifaceted, um, long-term nature of the, the inquiry that I'm engaged in. A lot of, of studies that I looked at when I was a graduate student were short-term. You went in, you did them in a semester, maybe a year. You were out of there. Most of my work has, has been ongoing now for five, eight years, and I see it continuing in that long-term nature. Another thing about it is that uh, I don't just use one technique. Some of the techniques or strategies or methods that I use may be very traditional. Some of them may be non-traditional. But I use as many different techniques as I can to find out as much as I can about a problem, about the solutions, and about the whole process of uh, implementing change. Um, to give you just an example of what some of the scholarship then might look like, my work really probably took a focus in the 80s. The 80s have been called the era of the reports or the, the beginning of, of one of our um, reform movements. I say one of them because there have been many reform movements in education. But the 80s was the beginning of another reform movement. We had lots and lots of reports that were out talking about the abysmal state of education. One of the things that I was particularly interested in was student performance in math and science. and. Along with that, I was very interested in the teaching of math and science, and particularly at the elementary level. How could we improve the teaching of math and science so that ultimately we could improve student performance in those areas? I'd say that that interest rapidly expanded to what's, what a lot of people now call systemic reform. That is, looking at reform from a systems perspective. And my belief was is that you can't change one part of the system without changing all parts of the system. 
doesn't do us much good to change the way we prepare our undergraduates if they're going out into schools where they're socialized to do very much the same that we've always done in schools, or the reverse of that. It doesn't do very much good for school people to try new approaches if we're preparing our students with the same approaches that we've always had in education. So we really, I really believe that we need to look at um, reform that is on all parts and is happening concurrently and hopefully involves all of the role players in that reform process. Now that obviously has some problems to it because when we talk about educational systems, um, there are lots of parts to educational systems and there are lots of players in educational systems. One uh, example that I, can, that I can use to show then a little bit more specifically what it is that we've done would be a project which we call the NSF project. But it was a, a group of us from the Colleges of Arts and Sciences and from education and the local schools got together and decided that we really wanted to do something about our, our systems and we wanted to do that together. And so we wrote a, a project, a proposal to the National Science Foundation, received funding and set about trying to look at reforming both of our systems. It involved university people from both, again, the College of Arts and Sciences, uh, scientists and mathematicians. It also involved educators, science and math educators. It also involved school people. We had teachers, we had principals that were part of our project. We soon found, once we got into it, that we had left out some critical role players, and those were parents and community members. So before long, we also had to start involving parents and community in this project. And one of the outcomes of this project was professional development schools. And through professional development schools, which we now have nine elementary professional development schools and one high school, and we're working on three middle schools right now, one of the uh, characteristics of a professional development school is it's, it, it becomes a vehicle for looking at reform within the university and within the schools at the same time. So it really is an example of ways to look at systemic change. Some of the things that we've done within that program and within the pro professional development school, I'll just focus for a moment on the pre-service teachers, our undergraduates, some of the, the projects we did with them. Um, we met in planning teams that involved all members, again, a cross-section of school people, administrators, students, and uh, folks from both College of Arts and Sciences and education to look at the content classes that we offered for these students, to look at the methods courses we were offering, to develop new field experiences, and to talk about ways that we could tie all of that together. Some of the things that we did to document this process, we bombarded those poor students that went through the program the first time with, with every survey imaginable. So that was a very traditional form of, of gathering information about our students. But we also looked at things like test scores, and we compared students in this program to students that were not in the program. We conducted interviews, we made observations, we videotaped the courses that were being taught. We also videotaped the students as they went out into the, their, the schools. We looked at student work, we looked at course documents. And again, it was a longitudinal study. We have three years of information on those undergraduates before they left our program, and we've continued to follow those students. They're now into their fifth year of teaching to really look at the process of change and how, you can, how we at a university level can implement some of, some of this change. Now, to me, what is it then? That's one example. We also, of course, worked with teachers and we worked with parents and we did similar approaches in all those areas. But I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about what scholarship is in a field like this to me. Um, I was taught that scholarship was research, it was presentations, it was articles, it was a generation of new knowledge. I still believe that that's all a part of scholarship, but I believe that there's probably more. My personal definition that I like to use is the impact that I have on the field. In my case, the impact I've had on the educational system. I look for the positive impact I've had on teachers, on students, on children. I look for any kind of impact that my colleagues and I have made in our profession. I also have thought a lot about how do you judge such scholarship. Is it the number of papers, the acceptance rate of the journal, the citations? Again, perhaps, but I think there's more to it. Something that I've found personally useful is if I'm interested in the impact, then one way of judging that is what's the difference I've made and how do I know I've made a difference? Some of the things that I find personally um, very useful is looking at what in education we call outcomes. What are, the, what are the byproducts? What's happening in the schools? Some of the things that are very meaningful to me are the teacher accomplishments. 
We have teachers that have been in this program who have won local, sta state, and national awards. We have teachers that are being highlighted right now for their action research projects, both lake, locally within the state and again at a national level. We have schools that have major accomplishments that have initiated family math pro programs, family science programs. We have Woodrow Wilson School that recently was one of five sites that was recognized for their professional development programs on a national level. We have our children's accomplishments. We have a group of kids in Manhattan, fifth grade students, that three years in a row have won the Physics Day competition at Worlds of Fun in their Physics Day, competing against uh, middle school and high school students. We have um, three classrooms who have won Toshiba Awards from, in, from the National Science Teacher Association. Again, a national award for a teacher and a classroom focused on, on innovations in science. We have children that are participating in science fairs. When I look at the science fair we had in our in our uh, mall two years ago, we had maybe 20 elementary students who participated. This last year, we had over 200. When I looked at the names on the rosters, I found that at the elementary level, every single child that participated was in one of the classrooms of teachers that we've been working with. These are things that I think are not usually a part of ways of judging traditional scholarship, but I think that we really need to examine uh, nowadays. I also, of course, look to our own program accomplishments the recognitions that we've received. Probably one of the things that has meant the most to me was that the uh, recognition we received from the um, Association for Educators of Teachers in Science, which labeled our NSF project, gave us the award for innovation in science teaching. Um, we were recently asked to go to Minnesota to speak to all of the teacher educators in the state about the program at K-State. Those are the kinds of things that, that I believe we need to be pursuing more in our scholarship. I've been lucky, just on a personal note, that I've been, my research has also involved very traditional forms, and I've been able to be successful in our system because of that. I'm very concerned, however, the work of reform is very time-consuming work. Oftentimes, people that are involved in that work are not going to have the time to be involved in more traditional forms of scholarship. And I worry about those people. I worry about those people that are our change agents, are our change masters. They're the ones that are leading our profession forward, and I think they need the support in developing new ways of identifying scholarship. Thank you. I must tell you that as we ordered our speakers, Gail discovered that she was last and said that she knew these folks and that did we really have to quit at 5 o'clock because she probably wouldn't get a chance to speak. Uh, I guaranteed her that, I, in, that in recognition of, of uh, the time constraints on each of them that I would keep mine uh, very short to give uh, them the opportunity. But Gail, there's also a reason why we put you last <laughs> so that we wouldn't run into 5. <laughs> Gail has a lot to be proud of, and, and, uh, and we're all proud of her and her work. Um, I, I'd like to, uh, th to thank the six of my colleagues uh, who agreed to give up their afternoon to uh, be here with us. I, I know what this group would cost me in consulting fees if they didn't already work here. Uh, I very much appreciate their taking time out of their busy schedule. Um, in closing, I, I'd uh, like to paraphrase Eisner once again. Concerns for verification, truth, and precision have led us away from an experiential conception of understanding and toward a verificationist conception of knowledge. In fact, we often talk about knowledge as if it consisted of measurable units, as in the often heard claim that knowledge doubles every 20 years. One can only wonder what constitutes a unit of knowledge. We prefer our knowledge solid and we like our data hard. Knowledge is process. A forever temporary state is scary to many. I congratulate the many faculty willing to be a little scared, willing to engage non-propositional inquiry on our behalf. Certainly the university can and must learn to recognize and reinforce intellect and creativity that's needed to solve big problems in difficult times. We thank you all for your attention this afternoon.